Hi there, welcome back to the channel. Welcome to another project video. This time it's an AM transmitter for the workbench, more specifically to put along with those modules over there. And this is uh, another project sponsored by PCBWay. I've had some boards made. Their production is perfect. My work, I guess we'll wait and see. I've actually got the unit completely built and done and tested. And that's what I'm going to show you during this video. I want to explain to you where I got the idea from. It's not an original design by no means. Mind you, most of these projects end up being ideas that you take from here and there. In this particular case, I wanted to build an AM transmitter module for the broadcast band for medium wave. And the reason is I'd be able to test my radios that I restore with that module. Now, I do get quite a few uh, medium wave stations from Canary Islands over here. Not so much locally. Locally, we've got one medium wave station and that's probably going to die soon. So it's quite useful to have one of these. I wanted this to work on the workbench and also to transmit through the house so that I can put my radios anywhere and tune them to the, uh, to the frequency that I'm transmitting at and hear radio throughout the house. If you've got a few dozen radios around, you might as well use them, right? So I went looking for some inspiration and hit a stumbling block. And the stumbling block is kind of unusual. The stumbling block was that I found a project on the web that was very, very well designed. When you find something like that and you think, Am I going to do better than this? And the answer is probably not. The next best thing is just to ask the author permission to develop the project, meaning take his project, maybe make some alterations because we all do and present it not as my own, but as his design, my modifications. OK, my humble modifications, quite frankly. So I contacted Mr. Charles Wenzel and he said, go ahead. No problem. I said I was going to mention him. He said, no problem. I said I was going to refer to his uh, website. I was going to link his website on my description, which I do. So by all means, go and check out his designs. And if you've got some time and patience to spare, stick around and watch me go through this and get this thing to a working condition. And it's not going to be the end of this. I'm warning you, by the end of this video, I've got some more ideas. So once again, I'll thank you in advance for your company. And I want to thank PCB Way for the sponsorship and the boards. Enjoy the video. This is where it all started my obsession with the uh, under-shelf test devices. I've been doing quite a few of them, as you may be aware if you've watched my channel. And more specifically, when I was doing the capacitance leakage tester, I asked for suggestions as to what to add to this, and quite a few mentioned a AM transmitter to test my radios. And this is what it developed into. Yikes. Yep, testing prototypes can be messy, but very useful. This is the project's humble beginnings. Really humble. A real mess on a piece of uh, printed circuit board. Everything uh, accessible. The uh, printed circuit board itself becomes a ground plane. And uh, this allows you to just add and remove, test, and access any test points you might want. Although this is what the project started out as, it actually started off with a different idea. Some of you may remember that I used this little FM transmitter to test some of my radios originally. These things are very common. They were sold. They still sold. You plug it into your phone and uh, you transmit the uh, signal coming in here from your ear earphone socket and you transmit it on FM so you can pick it up on a radio in a car. They're very low power, but they're actually pretty good quality and very cheap. But I wanted something for AM. And after a hell of a lot of research on the internet, I found this website, techlib.com, the property of a gentleman called Charles Wenzel. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. And he has this transmitter here, which he describes in great detail that I really liked. I liked the way he laid it out. I actually read the full description and it makes perfect sense to me. This one just had that something that gave me a hint that this would be better than some of those really simple AM transmitters that you find everywhere. And so I decided to give this a try, but I didn't want to be uh, an ungrateful thief. So I contacted the gentleman, asked for his permission, and he very kindly told me to go ahead. I've made quite a few modifications. The reason is he uses a crystal, in this case, broadcast band crystal, so that you get a fixed AM frequency on which you then apply the modulation. But I wanted to make this variable. And to do that, I decided to use a pretty simple circuit, also found everywhere on the internet, that uh, really is a variable a frequency oscillator. 
and you just have to get the right combination of components to make sure that it oscillates on the band that you want. The band I want is going to start at 500 and something all the way to 1600 and something. We don't even have to go the entire band, but I actually in the experiments found that I could get there. Again, that's just something that replaces this over here because that's your oscillator frequency going into this section of the, of the circuit. I'm going to link this website below because I think if you want to really build this, you should read the description. He does an incredibly good job of describing the circuit. And then he also describes how to build a little uh, fuel strength meter so you can adjust the antenna tuning to the optimum. There is a self-standing one here, a fun oscillator. Some of these were used in the old days where you wanted your turntable to transmit to your radio. This thing is completely self-standing and it works. I also experimented with that. If we go any, a bit further, he also has a circuit here where he uses a loop antenna, which allows you to get better distance. Remember, this is all within the legal framework of the maximum power that you're allowed to transmit without a license. He's got a very well drawn up project where you can uh, read the whole thing and make alterations as you please. Just make sure you don't exceed the maximum power rating. And Charles, I want to thank you for your kind uh, permission. My next step was obviously to get the schematic drawn up and take it from there, get a PC board and get the project done. The next bit of the video is going to be the circuit description. And I know some of you love it and some of you hate it. If you don't want to see that, just skip to this point in the video and that'll take you to the start of the actual build. Here's the schematic for the uh, entire transmitter and what I like to do when I explain something or when I try to understand something is to really just try and disregard some of the components that are there for purposes other than what the circuit is supposed to do. And I'll give you an example. If you look at the schematic you see a lot of components and sometimes it's difficult to understand what's going on here. So let's look at what happens if we remove some of the components that are here for secondary purposes like decoupling. What happens if we delete or erase or hide some of the decoupling components? You've got capacitors over there, there's another one there, there's another one there. Let's hide them. It's become simpler, right? We can go one step further. We've got a circuit here which in my case, in this case, is just a, an oscillator. But let's try and understand what's happening here. So let's hide this. And we can just label the carrier input. What's happening in the circuit is that there's a carrier that you've generated with that oscillator. And we can actually go one step further. We've got two parts of the circuit here. We've got this section over here and we've got this section over here. This one happens to be the modulation, but we can hide that as well. We just assume this is going down to something which is providing a load to the circuit. It's not an open circuit. It's not a closed circuit. It's not a short to ground. But it's something. We're not interested in what it is at the moment. We're just looking at this circuit here. We can actually clean this up a little bit further by removing the antenna. And let's just label it. See how much simpler that's become? Now what's happening on this part of the circuit? This turns out to be a very simple transistor biasing section over here and here. And then an amplification stage. But one step at a time. We've got 15 volts supply. It is coming down through these two resistors and it's creating a bias voltage at this uh, transistor over here. Exactly how much? Well, we know that we have a volt, a potential divider. Let's disregard the current going in there because it's very small. So we've got 3.9K, 5.6K, and the way you work that out is 3.9 divided by 3.9 plus 5.6 times 15. So what voltage do we get over here? Easy enough to calculate we actually end up with 6.16 volts at the base over there. See that? 3.9, that's that resistor, divided by the sum of the two, 3.9 plus 5.6 times the supply voltage gives you 6.16. There we go. That makes perfect sense, right? Because this is a DC blocking capacitor, so there's no DC voltage over here. The transistor has that at the base. And we also know there's another value exactly the same as this one, on this base, right? Because look at this, you've got supply, you've got the same resistor network here, the same voltage divider. So over here, you've also got 6.16 volts. There we go. So what happens next? Well, if you've got 6.16 volts, and really what I was trying to achieve was six volts, but to get six volts, uh, the uh, author of the article uses a 5.1K resistor over here. I don't happen to have a 5.1, so I used 5.6, and he uses a different resistor here. But this is close enough. This means that at this point, 
Remember, I've got 6.16 at the base. I've got a transistor over here. This is a diode drop, so I've got minus 0.6 or 0.7 volts. Let's call it 0.7 volts to this point over here. That means that I've got 5.46 volts over here, right? We've worked out the biasing arrangement on this circuit. So we have 6.16 volts and 5.46 volts at this end. And that really is the basis of what's happening here with this section. And what happens on this section? Well, whatever input carrier you send in here, it's going to superimpose itself on the DC voltage. So it's going to go up and down with the 6.16 as a center line. The same thing will happen here. It's going to go up and down with 5.46 volts as a center line because it's dropping the 0.7 volts over there. What happens at this end is that it goes across and it superimposes itself on this base voltage here as well. This can't really adjust much because what happens is this variable voltage, this alternating voltage on the DC is at, let's call it one megahertz in the broadcast band. Now, if you apply that alternating voltage to this point here and it gets superimposed on that one there, this should also go up and down, right? But there's a capacitor to ground over here. This capacitor is basically short circuiting that alternating voltage to ground. So this voltage here is staying at 6.16. It doesn't move or shouldn't move. But what's happening here now? You've still got this voltage going up and down here, right? So what's going to happen is that this 0.6 or 0.7 volts voltage drop across here is going to alter by this alternating voltage here because that one is fixed. If this is at 6.16 and this guy here comes to minus half a volt, that drops half a volt, that drops to 4.9 something, and suddenly this uh, pathway is changing in voltage and forcing the transistor to conduct more current or less current if the, if the reverse occurs, if this voltage goes up and that difference becomes less than 0.7. You've got to sort of look at this in a very um, dynamic way. You've got to see what happens when the voltage goes up and down. And what happens here? It goes up and down. And what happens here? It doesn't go up and down because it's being stopped by, uh, by this capacitor here. So the current goes up and down. Okay. So this is forcing this transistor to conduct current in harmony with that waveform that's going up and down here. That current is being generated or being passed through that part of that coil. And if you look at a coil that's drawn like this with a few windings here and lots of windings here, you've basically got an inductive load to this transistor. So this transistor doesn't care what's happening here. It just cares what happens across that coil, that part of that transformer that primary of that little transformer. So this current that's being generated, being alternated over here, is going through that, creating a voltage and current, which is get, it's getting amplified because this is an auto transformer now. Two turns, 20 something turns. So this ratio of voltage that's being generated here is amplified to this point, which then goes to the antenna. That's all that is, all right? Why do we have these guys over here? This one there, this one there. Well, this is to avoid oscillations. There are a lot of calculations you can do here. It has to do with the impedance, which will have an effect on the, uh, on the frequency, uh, frequency of the signal that it will attenuate or short out to the supply. Remember, with alternating current, with an alternating voltage, which is the case of our carrier, a short to the positive supply or a low resistance path to the, to the positive supply is exactly the same as a short or low resistance path to ground. You've got to understand that as well because ground and the positive supply, what they have between there is a potential difference, a voltage which could be a battery, and a battery is supposed to have a very low internal resistance for AC. So what you're doing is you're basically getting rid of some frequencies that could probably not be necessary at this point, or it could create oscillations. It could uh, generate oscillations because of sp uh, spurious uh, signals coming in here. The same thing over here, you're basically reducing the, the, the frequency that this thing can go up to, so it will stop oscillations as well. It dampens the signal. You don't want to dampen it in the frequency bandwidth that you're working with, so you don't want to dampen it in the 
you know, up to 1.6 megahertz because that's the broadcast band, but you do want to dampen it above so it doesn't create massive oscillations over here, take up power that you don't need, and um, really send stuff out of your antenna that's going to mess up your signal. That really, I hope, I hope that's understandable. That's really how this part of the circuit works. And when you look at it like this, it's quite simple. It is. Until you do something stupid like add a lot of components. It makes it complicated. Let's keep it simple for now. There we go. Much better. So now we're left with this section here, which is still blacked out, but we can certainly show it again. And here it is. So what do we have here? From the previous section, what we've determined is that we have 5.46 volts over here. And now we've got another transistor with another bias arrangement. And we go to the same calculation we did before. We've got 15 volts over here. We've got 3.3 and 15K over here. Voltage is divided to the base of the transistor. If we ignore the current going into the transistor base, which is small, let's work out what we've got at the base. And there it is. The voltage at the base is this resistor, 3.3 divided by 3.3 plus 15 times the supply voltage, which comes to 2.7 volts at the base. Okay? Now, if we've got 2.7 volts at the base and we've got a one diode drop across this uh, transistor junction here, what voltage do we have at the emitter of this transistor? Well, it's just minus 2.7 volts. So we're left with approximately 2 volts over there. Now that voltage in terms of DC is fixed. It's the bias voltage, the static condition voltage. And if we ignore this because DC doesn't go through a capacitor, we'll look at that in a second, we've got a 100 ohm resistor to ground. Now we know that with 2 volts there through a 100 ohm resistor, we're left with the current through R9, that resistor there, at 20 milliamps. Now the current of 20 milliamps flows down here very little flows into the base because of the gain of this tra transistor. So that means that 20 milliamps is flowing down here as well from this junction. And where does that current come from? Well, if you imagine this thing going up at one megahertz frequency, but goes up by half a volt, it means that this over here goes up by half a volt. Current still flows through there. But this thing going up by half a volt and that thing staying more or less constant, fairly constant, means that this transistor is shut down, so all the current, all the 20 milliamps, comes through that transistor there. As this thing comes down negative, it gets negative, this becomes more negative or lower. So let's say this goes to 4. Point, I don't know, 4.16 volts, say. Then this thing is higher, so this tap opens up, and the current that is flowing through here comes through that transistor. And this switching backwards and forwards, this differential effect, is what makes this transistor produce a current which is at the frequency of the carrier, and it's also modulated by how much current is going to be modulated here. And how does that work? Well, we've got 2.7 volts over here. You've got an audio source which is up and down based on the 2.7, so the amount of current flowing through here will be alternating. It'll be altering because it will have the, um, the effect of opening and shutting this transistor down at the frequency corresponding to the audio tone. That's basically how a modulator works. And this one works very well because what it does is it affects this differential amp here and makes this side, the RF side, produce the modulated current waveform, which then produces the modulated voltage waveform at the antenna. This works very well. Why do you have this down here? Well, this thing is basically an emitter follower, and it means that whatever peak or voltage is over there gets reflected down to here. If you do this, it means that for a certain level of frequencies above, really basic frequencies above DC, right, any alternating voltage over here can actually go through there, which means that the, um, the effect is increased and it makes this whole circuit more sensitive. If your, let's say if your audio signal is too low or too high, you can adjust it somewhat with this bypass. This is the emitter resistor bypass network. It's a shelf network. It's not for all frequencies, only for the frequencies that correspond to the time constant that you get. If you work out uh, the time constant between this resistor, that resistor, capacitor, and in, in fact, that resistor as well. 
but we won't go into too much detail there because it gets really complex. You can simulate this on LT Spice, it's really cool. But that's how this modulator works and it starts making a lot of sense. So now we've got these two sections described, hopefully it's understandable, and we have our carrier coming in. Now where do we get our carrier from? Now Mr. Wenzel gets his from a crystal oscillator. He uses a crystal with a transistor buffer which produces the carrier. I wanted mine to be uh, adjustable, so if I get rid of that and put that in there, what do we have here? We've got a Hartley oscillator, and a Hartley oscillator has the advantage of being very clean, very good uh, waveform coming out. It gives us a fairly good swing. In other words, the amplitude of the signal coming out here is pretty good. And basically all this does is it uses a tank circuit, in this case a, uh, an inductor and a uh, variable capacitor. And the capacitor I've used is one of those, which I'll show you when I build it, from those little um, AM FM radios, transistor radios. I happen to have one around. They're very easy to find and cheap if you buy them but you can get them out of an old radio and it allows you to go to about 350 picofarads if you join the two together. And the way I worked it out was uh, to get 250 picofarads and again I made reference to another project that I found on the web based on Mr. Wenzel's project. I'll link that below as well. You work out that you need about 300 uh, microhenries across here. So I wound this on a toroidal transformer till I got 300, I think it was 300, 280 was it? Microhenries. And then I took some tap, I took a tap off here which acts as the, the feedback to produce positive feedback to get this circuit to kick off and, and work. This uh, diode here limits the voltage over here. If it gets too high it brings it down, too short to the ground, so this uh, oscillator doesn't sort of run away with itself, it becomes pretty stable. Again this is a circuit, I can't remember who originally designed this, in fact, most of these things, it's hard to say who originally designed them because we all sort of get ideas from somebody else. But this thing works very, very well and I'll show you the result there. Now, what I've done here is I've actually taken the AM and the FM sections of the capacitor. That capacitor has got quite a few sections in there because it's designed so that you have a, um, you know, two gangs for the AM, two gangs for the FM. One is the RF circuit, one is the oscillator. So there's usually like four capacitors there plus trimmers. It's, it's a huge mess, but I've joined the two together, or I've made it possible to join the two together if the frequency range that I get is not sufficient. But again, that'll be experimentation. But this results in a signal over here, which is a signal at the carrier frequency that I tune to by playing with that. Now, I wasn't sure just how big a signal I wanted on here, how much swing I wanted on here, so I used a little trim pot and the trim pot allows me to adjust the level of that carrier that I'm going to feed in to that differential amplifier. So that's all it is. And then once we've looked at this, all we're going to look at is the antenna circuit and we bring it back. And what we're doing here is we just, uh, we've got a coupling capacitor between here and the antenna. And because the antenna becomes part of this whole tune circuit, tank circuit, with all sorts of components involved, uh, there's the antenna, which is going to be a wire, probably about two, three meters long. And depending on the actual antenna that you use, you can tune it to peak it. In other words, to get the right resonance frequency by using a capacitor here. Now, what I've done is I haven't made this variable, but when I experiment, I will be putting a variable capacitor here from an old radio. So we can see what sort of values will work across the range that we want and then I'll replace, replace it with a, uh, with a fixed capacitor. Mr. Wenzel actually, actually built a little um, field strength meter so you can actually peak it with the field strength meter and you can get a peak optimum situation all the time. Mind you, he's using a fixed frequency, so you peak it and then you know uh, what, what capacity you've got to use there, or you use a little trimmer. This is basically the circuit, and I really want to thank the, the people who developed the circuit, Mr. Wenzel especially, because it really is neat. And it's not one of those really simple things that you, you chuck a, 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 a crystal onto a, uh, onto a transistor and you expect it to work. In fact, it does work. But this one actually has quite a lot of thought that went into it and it works well. This, you've got to read the article because it does describe how best to come up with the right coil. The one I've used is not the right one, 
I had to wind a lot of turns. He then mentioned a particular type of ferrite core that allows you to uh, make less turns. Now I've ordered those, they're on their way, so I'll be able to replace that later. But that's what we've got. And then of course the other stuff is decoupling. And if you look at that, it's all these, you know. It's a decoupling cap at that supply point and some of these capacitors I actually added when I did the board design, the PC board design, because I realized I needed more of these capacitors closer to certain points where the supply was going. So you've got that one there, you've got these two over there, you've got that one over there, and the whole thing looks complicated, but when you break it down, it's actually very simple. Whew, that was a lot of talking. I think it's time to build this thing. And here are all the bits we need. We've got the boards from PCBWay. I want to thank PCBWay for sponsoring the video and the boards. They came out beautifully again. I can't attest for how correct my design was, but we'll see as we go along. But as far as the production is concerned, they came out fantastically. Again, with the rather bigger pads, so we don't have problems soldering. This over here is where this capacitor goes, and you can see I've been experimenting with it. This is one of those normal AM FM transistor radio capacitors. They come out of these little old radios that most people have lying around. Or you can buy them, you can still get them. But what this has got is it's got an FM section and an AM section, and it's got two capacitors. The center pin over there is the common ground, and then there's one capacitor between those two end ones, another one between these two, and what I've done is I've summed them. So I've used the common one there and I've joined these two together. This was done on the board itself in the trace. The other thing I've done is I've made it possible with this little thing over there to actually join these two as well if I need the FM ones as well. Now, as is usual, the AM ones are slightly bigger in capacitance value than the, uh, than the FM. But um, if you join the two FM together, you, you can get quite a bit of extra capacitance on here. There are also trimmers over here, so you can play with those as well. Now, what's going to happen is this is going to be on the side facing the front of the module. How does this work? It's going to be like this. Okay, it's going to be soldered on this side. And all the components, or most of the components, will be on this side facing the back. So I can get through to the trimmers over here. Hopefully, yes, it's aligned correctly. I can actually get through to the trimmers and make some adjustments if I wish. I'm not sure that I need to, but we can always do that. The holes that I've made there correspond to those trimmer caps over there. So I'm going to clean up some of these components and I'm going to reuse them, but I'm going to do this in stages. The first thing I'm going to do is actually build the oscillator circuit. So we'll be able to test the oscillator, see that we're getting the range we want, decide whether we want to um, short that out and add the FM capacitors as well. We'll be able to do some experiments. So this will be in two phases, first the oscillator and then the transmitter section. Now, as regards the coils, these cores were just those ferrite cores that I got out of uh, power supply. I just started winding on here till I got uh, 300 microhenries. I think it was 300 microhenries. And um, before I got to the end of that, I tried to sort of establish a ratio. In fact, I started with a small winding first. I tried to get a ratio. Remember that um, inductance is proportional to the square of the number of turns. So what I did is I took the number of turns that uh, Charles has on his uh, article. He said 2 to 28 or 27, I think it was. And I worked out what sort of inductance I needed to get. When I do the final inductors with the new cores that are arriving, I'll probably show you exactly how I build them. But what, what I've done is I've made a tap at the point where I believed would uh, re represent the ratio that he's got on there. It's easier to explain when I show you the winding of the new cores. But here we go. This one works. We've got the short ones over there and the long ones over there. So I'll be able to just remove them from here. And hopefully they will fit over there and they won't be too messy. I believe the ones that are coming are smaller in diameter. And they also have a lot less turns because the uh, permeability of those cores is different to this one. So I think they'll come out. Uh, they'll end up being a lot neater on this board when I've put the final ones in. But we've got these to work with, and that's what we're going to work with now. So I'm going to cannibalize or use, reuse a lot of these components on here. Some of these capacitors are not uh, zero temperature coefficient, NPO, NP0. But um, I might just build it with the ones that I've got on hand, and then 
it's very easy to replace them on this. This is an experiment at this stage. I'm not sure that this is going to be the final version, but we'll see as we get along, as we go along. All right, let me get cracking. First part is done. You can just see it over here. The oscillator has very few components. It's really got a JFET, a diode, a capacitor, and a resistor, and then of course the toroid coil. And I've got the little uh, potentiometer there to adjust the level of the output. And the capacitor, of course, is on the back side here. Now, we're going to test this. I've uh, actually changed the supply cap from 10 microfarad to 100 microfarad. At the end, I'll be showing the final schematic. I still expect maybe we'll have one or two little changes here. What I've done here with the MOSFET is I've actually put this socket there so that I can... Um, I was wondering whether this one was going to work first time. JFETs are um, strange little beasts. They're all different one from the other, so sometimes you, you need to make provision for possible replacement. Now, in the schematic I've got a, uh, what is it, 2N5457, and here I've actually got an MPF102. Now the uh, pinout's the same, it's uh, drain source gate. So if I wanted to change it, it would be the same. If I change it for MOSFET with a JFET with a different pinout, I have to be careful how I uh, plug it in there. As it happens, miraculously, and if you've done uh, oscillators before, you'll know that miraculously is, is a good word to use. The minute I switch it on, it started working. I'll show you. I'm going to apply power. Now, on the board, I've got 12 volts on there. I'm actually doing it by the original schematic or instruction. I'm using 15 volts. So everything is designed here for 15 volts. This part doesn't make much difference, but this section here does. It affects the biasing resistors. If we want to get exactly the same voltages that uh, the author of the original article has got in there. But I'm going to apply 15 volts. I'm going to show you the scope. I'm also going to show you the frequency on a little uh, frequency counter that I've got here. And I'll show you what happens when we adjust the uh, capacitor. We see what the, the extent of the range is. It's quite surprising. Okay, are we ready? I don't know where that is set at. I'm not sure where the tuning condenser is, but I'm going to hit the supply, put on power, and look at that. Look at that. What a beauty. What a beauty. And it's at 1.66 um, kilohertz, megahertz rather. This thing is obviously changing because just my approaching, moving my hand closer changes the uh, parasitics on here. So we have to be careful with that. Obviously when this is behind a shielded enclosure, that'll be a lot more stable. And also there's one more thing. These two probes, although they are set to times 10 mode, they do affect it slightly. But anyway, this is just to give you an idea. Let me show you where we are. We're actually at the end of the range. Let me go the other way. Look at that. 624 kilohertz. And it goes all the way to 1654. This is practically practically the full medium wave range. At the moment I'm not using these two capacitors on this side because I haven't shorted that link there. I don't think I need to. So these two trimmers are related to these two capacitors which are actually capacitor 1 is from this point to there, capacitor 2 is from this point to there. So these two are tied together. We've got two capacitors in parallel, so when I adjust I'm getting the sum of the two. But I've also got these guys to sum, so if we look at the uh, frequency there, I can adjust it somewhat. I can bring it down, or I can take it up. Now what's the maximum? I'm not sure what the maximum is. These things are trimmers, so they go all the way around. That seems to be that's going up, going up, going up. Doesn't really matter. I mean, this is just detail. I go to the other one now. It's going down. That's pretty good. I mean, this is practically the entire medium wave range. And if you look at the scope, you can see the amplitude is pretty stable. It goes from 624, which is practically the bottom of the medium wave, to 1653, which is practically the top of the medium wave. And of course, I can adjust it a little bit to the left or the right, depending on what I want. Now, 
Why did I have this here? Well, that uh, signal coming out is at 2.5 volts. I'm not sure that that is not too much for my um, for that differential amp here, but I can adjust it. Let's see where I am. I can go lower or I can go higher. That seems to be the peak. What is that? 3.7 volts peak to peak? I think that's more than enough for what we need. And this is not really related to the supply voltage. I believe, and this is where my ignorance comes in, I believe the amplitude that you get there is affected, of course I'm messing around with all this, is affected by the turns ratio on here. In other words, whereabouts you put that first tap. Uh, this is going to give you feedback, so it has to do with where you put that tap because it then creates a feedback path, a positive feedback, which causes the oscillator to oscillate. And then, of course, that little diode over there is um, limiting the voltage at the, the gate of the JFET to 0.6 or 0.7 volts, so it doesn't let it run away. And I'm sure I can alter that amplitude if I want to. But in the meantime, what I've got is one where I can actually reduce it somewhat. Let's look at that again. It actually seems to have less, less distortion when I go down. But it's a pretty clean sine wave. I'm sure that it's got harmonics. See, everything is very sensitive. The probe has actually disconnected here. So it does affect it. But I'm sure it's got harmonics. In fact, I know it's got harmonics. But it's actually a very nice sine, uh, sine wave over there. Very good as our carrier and very stable. What I did last night when I uh, built this, I put this on and I walked away, left it for some time and I came back and this thing was altering. Remember, this is 1,661, 1,661,587 hertz. It was altering practically only the last digit. So it was so stable, it's unreal. Again, obviously, because it's sort of floating around here and my fingers are going near it and everything else, it's going to fly all over the place. In fact, I've just touched the bottom there. But the other thing is this capacitor here, this 200 picofarad capacitor that's in the, in the schematic, I've used a MP0, is it? C0P, whatever they call them, the uh, temperature stabilized capacitors. That's the only one that's really in the in the tune, tune circuit over here. So I decided to use a good capacitor, but it's really academic because these guys aren't. And I'm sure that um, a couple of digits left and right will make absolutely no difference to the tuning on my medium wave radio, which is ah, it's quite wide anyway. And also the, uh, the width of the band that you're sending will depend more on the Q of the output tune circuit, coil and antenna and that capacitor than on the oscillator one. All right. Now, time to build the rest of the circuit. So here we are. Circuit's built, everything nice and neat. I'll just need to clean the solder flux. But um, now what I need to do is test it. And this coil is exactly the same as that one because I'm building the improved circuit. And I couldn't do the number of turns he had because I didn't have the right ferrite core. So I did the same as that one, total of 280 to 300 microhenries and tapped at the appropriate ratio. I'll be describing in more detail how to actually wind one of these when I get the proper uh, ferrite cores, the toroidal cores. But in the meantime, I'm actually quite anxious just to get this thing to work. I've got the socket in here for, or these two pins in here for the audio. First stage, what I'm going to do is just test the result without the audio. What I've got here, this is connected to about a three meter wire. This is my antenna. That there is ground. And you'll see why I've got that soldered there for now. Actually, I'll tell you, there's a capacitor here that's used to tune the output. What I'm going to do is I'm going to connect a variable capacitor across here. It's actually from an old radio, so I'll be able to tune it and see if we get an improvement on the scope. I'll be probing the output at the antenna itself because I believe with a 10 times probe the impedance will be fine. It shouldn't detune it much. But let's set this up and see what we've got. Let's see if it works. All right, folks, here we go. The antenna is connected to the piece of wire. The power supply is here. The scope is connected to the antenna. I've got no capacitor here at the moment. So let's hit the power 
and see what we get on the scope. Well, what are we getting on the scope? Get the triggering right. Hmm. It seems a little distorted, but I don't even know what frequency you're at. Ooh. Okay, you see what's happening here? Because I've got the antenna by itself and I don't have a capacitor, there's obviously stray capacitance. So there is a point where this hits resonance, and that point will depend on the frequency that I'm trying to transmit here. So let me get this down a bit and increase, get to the resonant point. See that? I'm going through the frequency band, and it's peaking at 1.4 megahertz. Okay, and I'm getting 15 volts over there. Now let me tune it a bit. What I've got here is this big capacitor, just connected two clips on here, and I'm using one of them. So I think it's about 350 picofarads total. And I'll put that across the antenna, and you can see that go down. Now if I tune this, goes down, if I go long, goes up, and it's hit a maximum. Okay, let me go to a different frequency. Let me go down, and it's going up. Let me go to one meg, about one meg. Now watch this. There we go, there's my peak. So that is tuned. I'm starting to see a problem here. I'm tuning the uh, oscillator, but it seems that I'll have to put a, a tuning capacitor on the output as well. And that is a problem because I'm not going to have two capacitors here. I'll probably have to sort of leave it at the middle, which is one megahertz. What happens if I leave it there and then just tune across? Okay, will it still work? Uh, that's the lowest frequency. Sorry, that was the highest frequency. So this does sort of peak somewhere and it looks like there's a certain band that I can use. That's from, why is this thing doing that? Okay. That is at one point, well, there is, see, let's call that the usable range. That is 800 and something to 1.2. Mm, that could be a problem. That could well be a problem. What am I going to do about this guy? It's sort of starting to look like the idea of having a fixed frequency or a short span of frequencies is starting to make more sense. Now remember, my goal was to make this thing completely tunable. And I suppose it could be completely tunable unless I got to there and that theoretically is zero microfarads, uh, picofarads, so I can't go lower than that, which means that this thing is peaking at 1.3, 1.3. So if I go any higher in frequency, I really can't peak the antenna. And of course, that'll differ depending on the antenna. You see, I'm going to remove this crock clip from the little wire, and that now it's just got this here. Now it's going to peak somewhere else. It's going to peak at 1.3. So you see the dilemma. I'd like to be able to see a peak and know that it's within my tuning range. That's 1.4. Mm. Okay, but that's what we've got. That's what I'm going to leave. I'm going to connect the antenna up again and you see that it makes a difference. I'm going to peak it. Actually, I'm just going to tune it to a peak over there. And the best thing to do is to leave this at about halfway. Tune it to a peak over here. And then I can adjust this somewhat. Yeah, OK. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a modulating signal. And what I'll be using is a 1 kilohertz tone. Let me just get this right. Okay, 
and I'm going to switch on the signal generator at an amplitude of 100 millivolts and I can see modulation going on there. Let me just bring this guy down so we can fit it nicely on there. Now we'll do this and I have to trigger this on something other than channel 1. Let's try the AC line source. Oh, that's good enough. Okay, so we can see modulation happening, but it's not much modulation, is it? Does this make any difference? No, this just changes the amplitude of the final output. I'm going to increase the modulation to 200 millivolts, 300, 400. Okay, I've got to drop the vertical scale again. Let's do that. Okay. It's looking quite nice. See that? It's looking really nice. Let me try 600 millivolts, 7, 8. This is um, RMS. There's 1 volt RMS and that's almost 100%. That's 100%, 1.3. I would think that 1 volt, which, which is what I'm using now, is probably the best position to set it at. Let me just stop that. See, we've got a very, very good amplitude modulated carry over there. Very, very good. It's working perfectly. Is it transmitting? Well, for that I've got something else. I have got a Bluetooth module here. It's an Aralic from Aralic. They sell these modules that receive, uh, you can use them with Bluetooth, with Wi-Fi. At the moment it's looking for Wi-Fi. It'll find Wi-Fi. And the audio that I send from my phone, for example, to this particular device will come out here. It's coming out as a stereo signal. When that stops blinking, it means it will have uh, logged in, clicked in. And then my signal, this one here, it's going to go in here. And what I have here is I've got two 1K resistors just to make this stereo signal mono. And then my signal there is mono, there's my ground, and that's now the one going to my audio source. So what I'm going to do is just send some uh, royalty-free music and see if we can see it on the scope and then hear it on an AM radio. That's the ultimate test. See if it's distorted, because there's all sorts of settings you can play with on the actual output tank circuit to give you the right cue. In other words, to give you the, the right steepness of the curve, of the... Um, resonance so that it allows bandwidth for the actual audio to go through. So I don't know whether it's going to sound muffled, whether it's going to sound good. We'll find out. I've got this little app. It's, uh, I think it's EU Toolkit. It's got a signal generator on here. What I've done is I've got it ready with a 500 hertz tone instead of hearing it on the uh, iPad itself. I'm sending it to the workbench receiver, which means it's going to go through the that Aralic and come out and go into the radio. Now, what is this? This is on maximum amplitude. Let's put it a bit lower down. And we can look at the scope and let me hit it. Well, that's it. Oh, it's there. Okay. This amplitude is obviously not enough. Let me up it. Okay. That's respectable. It's not quite 100% modulation because the amplitude is obviously not high enough. But I've got a trick for that as well, and it has to do with that little uh, resistor capacitor that you put on, on there. If we look at that scope, and if I bypass, without the resistor, I'm just going to take a 2.2 microfarad capacitor, and I'm just going to bypass that resistor on the emitter, the 100 ohm resistor. It's the same as that resistor capacitor would do. I'm just going to bypass it, and watch what happens to the gain. Well, you don't see much, do you? Doesn't do much. It should make it more sensitive. It should sort of double the gain. Mm, not getting much. But I know that I can increase the amplitude there. I'll put a bigger capacitor next time. If I use that uh, resistor capacitor network on the emitter of that um, current source transistor, the bottom one, I can increase the gain. 
In other words, increase the sensitivity instead of needing about uh, one point something volts RMS, maybe it'll do with 0.5 volts RMS or something like that. But what I've got now is I've got this thing transmitting a tone and the question is, is this being received on my radio? Okay, I've got my radio with medium wave on here. Oy, this is noisy on this bench. But let me tune around and see if I can find the tone. Huh. That's my tone. Can't even see what frequency I'm transmitting at at the moment, but that's working. If I change the tuning, you can see the difference. So I, peaking the antenna is important. And I presume this is sort of directional, except that I've got the antenna right above the bench anyway, so it doesn't really make any difference. Let's try some royalty-free music. Okay, royalty-free music. I don't even know what this is. Let's just play anything. Ha! Huh. I can hear it. Well, it's working. What happens if I remove the big antenna and then have to tune it again? Yeah, it does make a difference. Put the antenna back. And of course, we need to tune it. works pretty well. This is really boring. Let's try something else. That's better. It looks like the bandwidth is fine. Now what I want to try is to see where, how far I can receive this in the other rooms. Let's check it out. Well, folks, it looks like we got a winner here. This thing was working pretty well. I tried um, quite a few different rooms in the house. First, it was in the lounge and um, it sounded quite good. Then it actually got better as I got further away, strangely enough. I went to the kitchen. I went to the dressing room. I went to the bedroom and it's picking up pretty well. Now, there is a bit of hiss. Mind you, this is um, transmitting through the house, so some hiss or some uh, static would be expectable. But it's much, much better than I thought, and I haven't even optimized coils or anything like that. So my conclusion is that um, bar a few adjustments and some thought on what I'm going to do about the tuning range versus the antenna tuning capabilities, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do about that. But um, bar that, I think this guy is a success. I haven't found any mistakes on the board. Get rid of that. So what are my thoughts right now? Well, there's a lot of optimizing that I can do when I finally get the, uh, the correct cores. And I will be doing another video where I try that out, show you how, how I wind them and how they work. 
And what sort of antenna I'm going to put up here. I'll tell you what I was thinking of doing. I've got this copper tape and I was thinking of just getting three meters of this and sticking it on the edges of those shelves up there. And that would be my antenna, which would then lead into the unit, the module, that will have this housed in it. And that would sort out the antenna thing. But there's something else has come up. After I try the different cores, simply to make it complete, I might actually experiment with the um, loop antenna option that he's got there, where he does a rectangular loop. Now, I probably will not use a rectangular loop. I'll probably use something smaller with more turns. And that means the inductance will be different, so the tuning will be different. And I know for a fact that I won't be able to get away with um, tuning the, the uh, carrier frequency and tuning the antenna without having two capacitors. So I may well do the same thing, which is keep the frequency more or less stable with a little trimmer that I can adjust one way or the other. And then I can um, tune the antenna properly with the capacitor. I can actually use this capacitor to tune the antenna. It's probably more important. But I might try the loop. The loop is something I'm curious about because I'm actually convinced uh, and reading uh, Charles Wenzel's uh, website tells us that the, um, the range is improved and the noise is reduced dramatically because you're using magnetic radiation rather than electrical. So that's where I am at the moment. I'm happy with the result and I'm happy with the potential of actually improving my own design or my own project. This is not my design, as I mentioned it before. This is Mr. Charles Wenzel's work and I want to thank him for it. So I'm not going to publish or share the boards just yet because I want to see what happens when I wind the final transformers and try the experiments with the, with the other antenna version. I'll have to change some of the resistors. Everything else stays the same. If you look at the schematic that he's got, it shows you that. It works for 24 volts and the resistors change, the biasing changes, everything else stays exactly the same. So that's why I'm going to leave it for now. I've got myself a transmitter. Brilliant. Always wanted one. So I'm going to sign off by thanking you for your company. Hope you've enjoyed that. If you have, click like, share, subscribe and all that jazz. And if you want to support the channel directly, you can do so on Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the description below. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. And most of all, stay safe.